on Business Incorporated. This Friday, South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa presents his first State of the Nation address since his elections, promising to grow the sluggish economy. And Zimbabwe's currency hits a new low as companies demand payment in U.S. dollars. Plus, French car maker Peugeot today opens $630 million Morocco plant. Hello and welcome to the show. I am Bosin Namafa. I am sitting in today for Chimeze Obi Wagu, your regular host. Let's kick off from the markets here in Africa, where the Nigerian Osha index saw a sluggish 0.01% change. In today, in South Africa, the GSE group is uh, slightly above 59,000 reading, and you can see that about two tenths of a percent in the green territory, in the uh, positive territory. Egyptian uh, case 30 uh, down 0.63% on the final trading day of the week. That was on Thursday. As close for today, where the Kenyan market was uh, reading 147.58 also on Thursday. That's uh, uh, taking a look at the uh, uh, closer to closing numbers for the week for most African markets. But for the Gulf region, the markets closed the week positive on Thursday as oil prices rose and rekindled. U.S. China trade talks also cheered investors' mood, while Saudi Arabia extended losses on Western regional geopolitical tensions. Those are the four uh, major. Uh, Middle East markets will cover for you from Abu Dhabi, where the market was a roaring 1.4 percent. The Dubai financial market uh, was 0.74 percent. The Qatar index gained 1.7 to reach its highest level since February, boosted by 3.5 percent a hike in Qatar National Bank and a 2.2 percent rise in industries. The Abu Dhabi index, you see that the Emirates uh, Telecommunications added 2.8 percent, and first Abu Dhabi uh, Bank was up 1.2 percent. Uh, Saudi Arabia was uh, 8,869 reading. Uh, that's about 0.7 percent, about three quarters of a percent. Lifted by Emma Properties, which closed 3.2 percent uh, higher. The index, which fell the day before, dropped about another 0.7 percent, which most of its banking uh, shares in the negative uh, territory. Also, uh, tra Europe is still trading as we speak. European trading day, the stocks were slightly higher on Friday morning amid intensifying fears of a military confrontation. In the Middle East, as U.S. President Donald Trump uh, pulled his fingers off the uh, button, at, uh, calling for an attack, uh, pushing for an attack uh, against Iran. But uh, more from the European space, Daniel Coop, my colleague from the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, is joining us to uh, put all this geopolitics together, uh, but uh, and how this is affecting uh, the aviation industry. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration uh, Thursday issued an emergency order prohibiting U.S. operators from flying in an overwater area of the Tehran-controlled airspace. Uh, we've seen United uh, Airlines saying it's canceling those flights. So, Daniel, let's chat to this and other issues around here. You, uh, you're a broadcast journalist, but then you also have your, your fingers in the aviation industry. Bring us up to speed here. Yeah, exactly. Hi there, Bozna. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, I can tell you this. This uh, topic is certainly uh, keeping uh, the airlines uh, very busy today because the flights over, uh, because there are every day hundreds of flights that are usually routed over uh, Iran. Uh, for example, uh, when you go to the Middle East, when you go to India, but also, uh, you know, many cases uh, when you go somewhere to Asia, like to Singapore or Thailand. So many airlines uh, based here in Europe also when they are coming over from the United States are using their slots. So they are, are very busy, um, all of them right now, um, basically to find alternative routes, which then uh, results in uh, longer flight times, of course, also for passengers. Uh, we are getting word from a, a couple of airlines that have decided, because of the latest uh, geopolitical tension, to reroute their flights. Uh, Malaysia Airlines, uh, Australia's uh, Qantas Airways, uh, Singapore Airlines, KLM, Emirates, uh, Germans uh, carrier. Uh, Lufthansa, they are all uh, rerouting their flights, uh, trying to avoid the street of homes. That is the area uh, where many people feel that uh, all of this uh, still could get uh, very dangerous in the next days. And let me also tell you here from the investors' uh, perspectives that investors are monitoring this situation with uh, quite some uh, concern. You can see it in the background, the blue chip index stuck today, not really knowing in which direction uh, to head. Uh, we are down uh, here right now, uh, just slightly but with about uh, five uh, points right now here in uh, the red. 
because on the one hand, yes, there is uh, the fear that this uh, entire situation there in the Middle East uh, could escalate. On the other hand, investors also know that uh, U.S. President Donald Trump right now is uh, in campaign mode right now. He was kicking off his campaign um, uh, this week, announcing that he would be running again uh, to become uh, again also for the next term uh, the U.S. president. And when we just imagine the scenario of a possible war between the United States and Iran, this would most likely result into uh, the death, or death of uh, uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, soldiers uh, on both sides. Um, most likely this would also affect uh, uh, exchanges around the world. And if something what Donald Trump doesn't need right now for his campaign is negative uh, PR. Um, all of this would be uh, questioned, uh, certainly. So some people here on the trading floor, uh, they don't even think that the situation is that bad. Of course, the rhetoric now is uh, very strong. Some are even saying uh, that um, all of this could be just a strategy right now um, of the White House. Uh, but certainly they're monitoring all of this uh, with uh, great concern at the moment. Yes, well, uh, Daniel, it's good news that the concerns heightened yesterday are slacking off a little bit. So we can all take a breather over the weekend and expect uh, a few other things to, uh, to take the front seat. Uh, so let's get back to the markets proper. I, I can't remember the t number of messaging apps that I have on my phone or that exist out there. Perhaps you have a better idea. You're a bit much younger. You have a lot of hundreds and hundreds of, of apps, <laughs> messaging apps. So I'm getting all. I just want to talk to you and send a message to you. Why do I need a new app called Slack? $20 billion, share price of 50% on the NYC. I don't know what's going on with this crowded apps. They're going to crowd out all the apps. Yeah, you're so right. I was counting the apps that I have on my phone that you can use uh, for messaging purposes. I use, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not even that I use that many. I have a WhatsApp, I use uh, Telegram, and I have an app that I use for another TV network called TeamWire. Uh, we both may be a little bit behind because when we communicate, we still, uh, you know, write emails to each other. But uh, those apps like uh, Slack, like TeamWire, they're getting um, uh, very popular recently because they are considered as uh, faster and uh, that you can get pretty much you know faster results when you when you talk to each other on uh, these apps and that is the uh, reason why investors are uh, considering all of this um, as very interesting and uh, Slack is saying that um, already 600,000 organizations worldwide are using um, their software a uh, very interesting though the company made a loss of 140 million dollars last year but is growing quickly and that is always uh, the risk uh, factor because uh, when we talk about some other, you know, very hot IPOs that we saw during the last uh, year, I mean, Uber, uh, Lyft, I mean, all those companies, I mean, they were, uh, they were praised, they got lots of, uh, uh, you know, positive uh, PR at the beginning, but then the result for the shareholders was uh, in some situation more like a nightmare, not really a success story. In the case um, of a Slack, all of this could be even uh, be a little bit more risky because they decided uh, to have a direct um, uh, placement there at the uh, New York uh, Stock Exchange, which, me which means that no um, other um, investment banks are directly involved um, in uh, the IPO. All of this at the beginning, um, yeah, interesting for investors, but also very risky. Let's see how the share price will develop today, if it's going to be again as successful as yesterday. I'm going to sit down here, fold my hands, watch you our guys sort it out in the new world of ap apology. I said, well, A P P O L O G Y, they got an apology. But what's, what's next week? What's on the radar for next week? Uh, the G20 meeting, the European uh, uh, special meeting for uh, June the 38th for new elections of new leaders. What's going on next week? Give us a hint, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned some very interesting uh, facts already. Um, well, I mean, I guess the geopolitical uh, situation is going to be the number one topic, uh, certainly for investors uh, next week. What's going to happen now between Iran and the United States and the trade conflict certainly also uh, still ongoing with the G20 summit at the end of the month uh, taking place and this uh, very um, high-ranked meeting between the U.S. president and his Chinese counterpart uh, trying to find a solution in this uh, ongoing uh, trade conflict. 
conflict. Um, then also very interesting, we'll be getting here um, in Germany the latest business climate index. Also, of course, very interesting in these uh, times with lots of uncertainty um, how this is going to develop. Then we'll be getting also news uh, from the European inflation rate, which is, of course, always very interesting also when we talk about the monetary policy of the European uh, Central Bank and uh, Eurostat. That's the statistic office here uh, in the European Union will be giving us the latest numbers from the European uh, tourism sector. So, of course, now it's summertime, lots of people going on vacation. Very uh, interesting uh, times, of course, for airlines and uh, travel organizations. So, yeah, we'll be uh, talking about that. Well, actually, not me. My colleagues will be here. But, uh, yeah, he'll be discussing all of that with them and with that uh, back to you in Lagos and happy weekend from all of us Thank here in Frankfurt. Thank you so much uh, Daniel Coop, slacking it all a little bit on the market. Enjoy your weekend. We'll get to get together sometime in the very near future. My colleague uh, DWTV for Channel Television at the Frankfurt Stock Exchange. Uh, as we speak, the FTSE is uh, still taking a front seat against its European peers, the German DAX and the Kakoron and the, even the stocks 600. Uh, but the pound sterling uh, is taking a bit of, uh, of a hit as we speak as the fight uh, for number 10 down the street is now down to Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt. So I'm just thinking uh, if uh, Johnson will be able to hunt out Jeremy in the race for number 10 down the street to replace Theresa May. Uh, my colleague uh, there at our London studios, Simon Pusey, is there to paint the marker scenario for us. Uh, Simon, between Hunt and Johnson, who is hunting who here? And what are the likely market scenario if Johnson, who is the front runner, wins number 10? What are the permutations that have been reported in the UK media? Yeah, afternoon, Boson, you're right. It's um, Hunt or Boris. Boris Johnson, a flamboyant former foreign secretary and ex-mayor of London, known for his mop of blonde hair, great for a soundbite, and somehow manages to squirm away from the controversial things he said in the past with a lot of bluster and a lot of charm. He's a very sort of British person. And um, the, as the historian Max Hastings puts it, Boris will say absolutely anything in order to please an audience. He would have told passengers on the Titanic, he said, that rescue was imminent. But he is the runaway favourite, having led in all five voting rounds of a contest that began with 10 contenders. Betting markets give Johnson a 92% probability of becoming Prime Minister and Hunt just 7%. The markets are not going to like that one bit, and Sterling is already uneasy at the thought of that. But there is also the argument some are making that because he is such a runaway favourite that actually the markets have already factored this victory in for him. It's the uncertainty, really, that's killing investment and market sentiment towards the UK, and actually the certainty of knowing who the next Prime Minister is um, going to be could actually help the markets in the short term at least so i think most people thinking it's going to be johnson not hunt but as hunt says in his own words um surprises do happen in politics interesting how uh, this hunting uh, is going to end for number 10 down in streets so uh the london market still uh, a bit of a out well, a little bit in green territory uh, alongside the rest of European bosses early today, but right now the human market is a bit flattish, then it's going back up again. Is this all still related to the Bank of England's uh, McKinney's statement of yesterday and all of that? Simon? Yeah, the market's mainly affected um, by the circus that is that Tory election campaign, but also very much what's happening in the Middle East. As I know you've been covering the FTSE, all share was up earlier. The FTSE 100 inched up very slightly too with oil majors rallying as crude prices rose due to those tensions you referred to in the Middle East between the US and Iran. Meanwhile, the domestically focused FTSE 250 mid-cap index slipped. That's down 0.09% as worries about a no-deal Brexit put pressure on sterling. Speaking of the pound, it is down across the board today, down against the dollar by just under half a percent, down on the euro also by just over half a percent and also down slightly on the yen. Looking at the rest of the day, the markets will be looking out for the updates from the Middle East. The New York Times has reported that Donald Trump had initially approved military action on a few targets um, in Iran before rowing back on that decision. So further um, uh, investors and traders will also be looking out for Boris Johnson potentially responding to Mark Carney, who earlier rejected his claim that the UK could avoid being hit by tariffs if it left the EU 
without a deal. So traders and investors looking at those topics really, looking on what's going on in the Middle East, what's going to happen with um, Boris Johnson, Jeremy Hunt, and, and maybe any more comments from Mark Carney um, after that meeting yesterday with the Bank of England. Uh, Saban Puse out of our London studios. Thank you so much. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, let's leave it there for today, and then we'll come back in the days ahead. Let's take a break, everyone. We're back in two, and we're, of course, we're starting with uh, uh, outlook on President Ramaphosa's speech, uh, the first after his elections. That's all the way from South Africa.